Hezekiah, the events around the Assyrian siege of Jerusalem and the deliverance of Jerusalem miraculously. That's 701. Now, uh, the second part of Isaiah uh, is a, a prophecies that prophesy the exile and the return from exile. So it's uh, whereas the focus of the first part is around 701, the focus of 40 to 55 is the events around 539 to 537 BC. And uh, you get a miraculous series of events. The Babylonian Empire was destroyed by the Persian king 539. And then in 537, that Persian king um, commanded, told the leaders of uh, the Jewish community in exile to go and rebuild the temple in Jerusalem. Now, uh, the prophecies here focus around those events. King Cyrus... The, the one who built the second temple. Now notice that? The pagan king commanded the second temple to be built. That's the turn of events and the return of a remnant, a small group, small surviving group from exile in Babylon back to Jerusalem to rebuild the temple. Um, round about that series of events. So it's, um, the focus here is on Zion at the time of the uh, Babylonian exile. Um, the structure, notice here um, that uh, there's three very important pointers. There's commands to leave Babylon in 48 verse 20 and 52 12 that culminate then in the description of leaving Babylon. Let's just go to the first of these commands to leave Babylon. Uh, Garth, 48 verse 20. Forty-eight verse twenty. Leave Babylon, flee from the Babylonians, announce this with shouts of joy and proclaim it. Send it out to the ends of the earth. Say sorry, send it out to the ends of the earth. Say, the Lord has redeemed his servant Jacob. That'll do. Um, so, leave Babylon. Um, God has redeemed his people from exile in Babylon. Um, no, this, uh, it's very hard to divide the material here because you, it's all so intricately interwoven. But uh, you could divide it into three general parts. First of all, you get... Uh, God's preparation of a way to bring his people back home from exile, back to Zion. Secondly, and this is the part that the Jewish people found so hard to accept, is that God didn't raise up a second Moses to rescue his people, but God used a pagan king, King Cyrus, to free his people and to rebuild his holy city, Zion. Thirdly, from chapter 49 to 55, the focus is on an unnamed figure called the servant of the Lord. A mysterious figure. The servant of the Lord who is called by God to restore his people and to fulfill the mission that God had for Zion and Jerusalem, which is to reach out to the nations and to include them in the worship of the Lord. Um, the servant of the Lord. Now that's going to be very important uh, for Second Isaiah and is terribly important for us as Christians. Um, let's look at the main themes. Um, first of all, let's go to chapter 40, 1 to 11. Now this is not going to be all that easy uh, 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 to... to a lot of this you could only see stuff if you went to the Hebrew. But basically what you have here is uh, God's, uh, the return of the people from exile to Jerusalem as a second exodus. Remember God brought his people from Egypt to the promised land. So now God 
prepares a miraculous way in which he can bring back the people to himself. Whose turn to read? Okay, Josh, can you start reading 40, 1 and 2? And here you get God speaking in his heavenly court to the angels. Uh, it's plural. You, plural, comfort my people. And he's speaking here to the angels. Comfort, O oh comfort my people, says your God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem and cry to her that she has served her turn, that her penalty is paid, that she has received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins. Right. Um, God commands his angels to comfort his people by saying that God has forgiven them and they will restore them. Then you get um, uh, the voice of one messenger, messenger one, uh, coming from God, verses three to five. A voice cries out, in the wilderness prepare the way of the Lord, make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be lifted up and every mountain and hill be made low. The uneven ground shall become level and the rough places a plain. Then the glory of the Lord shall be revealed, and all people shall see it together, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. This is probably an angel. An angel is to proclaim this message, but it's not proclaimed to anybody. A word is spoken in the desert, prepare a way for the Lord, make straight in the desert, the wilderness a highway for a God. And this is a miraculous way because it's the way in which God will come to rescue his people and to bring the people back home mountains will be leveled, valleys will be filled in to create this spiritual super highway and the purpose of this way is for God's glory his presence to be re revealed not just to the Jews but all nations on the earth God's glory, his presence, his saving presence to all people on the earth, yes? I never got that before. I always thought it was there's a voice of one calling in the desert. Yes. Way, but it's, he's actually speaking in the desert. So yes. Probably because John the Baptist was in the desert. Yes. And that's okay. why he's symbolic, but uh, yeah, the significance yes. of that. In the desert. Yeah. Yes. It works both ways, but um, the voice calls in the desert prepare. This is the initial message of the angel. Then who picks it up? John the Baptist picks it up. And it's the way of repentance that John proclaims. So you get the first messenger, um, the angel, and that's picked up by John the Baptist in the desert. Um, then I pick up at uh, verse uh, 6. The voice says, cry out. And I said, what shall I cry? Now, who? a voice speaking, probably another angel, or the same angel, says to the prophet, cry, preach, and the prophet says, what shall I cry? What shall I preach? And now you get the content of the sermon that he is to preach. I uh, know, um, uh, you get his objection, what shall I cry? Uh, remove the quotation marks there. I think it's best said, uh, what shall I cry? All men are as grass, and all their glory like the flower of the field. Grass withers, flower fails, because of the breath of the Lord blows upon him. End of the speech. He says, what's the point of speaking your word to the people? Because people basically come and go and are useless. They don't last. What's the point of preaching people that they are supposed to walk in the way of the Lord? And now you get the answer. Keep going on from there, please. From, from surely. This is, this is the answer of the... Uh, messenger, the angel. Surely the people are grass. The grass withers, the flower fades. But the word of our God will stand forever. Now, very important there. The angel agrees. People are unreliable. People can accomplish nothing spiritually. But what is it that accomplishes everything? The word of God. Um, proclaim the word to the people, not because people are strong, but because the word is strong and accomplishes everything. And now you get the prophecy of the return back home. Um, and it's hard to know here, at this stage, who the messenger is. Keep going, please. 
Get you up to a high mountain, O Zion, herald of good tidings. Lift up your voice with strength, O Jerusalem, herald of good tidings. Lift it up, do not fear. Say to the cities of Judah, here is your God. See, the Lord God comes with might, and his arm rules for him. His reward is with him, and his recompense before him. He will feed his flock like a shepherd. He will gather the lambs in his arms and carry them in his bosom and gently lead the mother sheep. Ah. Now, there's so much here that I can't touch on, but there's two options here. Number one, um, the uh, angel here tells the prophet to be a messenger or gospel messenger to Zion and the cities of Zion or else Zion is called to be a messenger to the cities of Jerusalem. Now, both are possible, and I think both are meant. Have you, can I see it again? Um, the prophet is to be a messenger of good news to Zion and the cities of Zion, and Zion herself is to be a messenger of good news to her surrounding satellite towns, her suburbs. Now, what is the good news? The good news is something miraculous. Instead of God telling the people to come back home to himself, what does God do? He goes and rescues his people and brings them back home to himself. Like a sheep collect, I mean shepherd collecting the sheep, carrying the sheep back home. Can I repeat that again? Repentance is returning to God. And the way we understand it is that we have to repent to come back to God. But this turns it on the head. The way of repentance is God coming to bring us back on his way to himself. And he does that at great cost to himself because he has to fight our enemies, rescue us, and to bring us back home to himself as his booty from the battle. <coughs> That's the picture here. God bringing people back home to himself. Next a passage. Well, who's next? Dylan, you are it. Um, and this is one of the most strange, mysterious things here. God doesn't appoint a second Moses to rescue his people, but appoints a king to be his anointed a pagan king Cyrus to be his deliverer, the deliverer of his people. Can you go to chapter 44 verse 24 following please Dylan? 24. Oh, wow. Chapter 44, 24 to 45 verse 13. Um, we won't take verse 13, it's too much, let's just go to verse 7. Just read first of all to the end of chapter 44. Jerusalem to be inhabited. This is what the Lord says, your Redeemer who formed you in the womb. I am the Lord who has made all things, who alone stretched out the heavens, who spread out the earth by myself, who foils the signs of false prophets and makes fools of diviners, who overthrows the learning of the wise and turns it into nonsense, who carries out the words of his servants and fulfills the predictions of his messengers. Who says of Jerusalem, it shall be inhabited of the towns of Judah, they shall be built, and of their ruins I will restore them. Who says to the watery deep, be dry and I will dry up your streams. Who says of Cyrus, he is my shepherd and I will accomplish all that I please. He will say of Jerusalem, let it be rebuilt, and of the temple, let its foundations be laid. Look at verse 28. Instead of God choosing one of his own, one of his people, to rebuild Jerusalem and the temple. He says what to Cyrus? He says of Cyrus, he is my shepherd, the one who shepherds my people. Now, the king was the shepherd of Israel. Now, Cyrus, a pagan king, is chosen as God's shepherd. Uh, he will accomplish all I please. He will say of Jerusalem, let it be rebuilt, and of the temple, let its foundations be laid. So God uses a pagan king to rebuild his city and to rebuild his temple. You can imagine that people would have found, the people of God would have found that hard to take. Um, 
Let's go on. Then it's more about Cyrus. This is what the Lord says to his anointed, to Cyrus, who, whose right hand I take hold of, to subdue the nations before him and to strip kings of their armor, to open doors before him so that gates will not be shut. I will go before you and will le level the mountains. I will break down gates of bronze and cut through bars of iron. I will give you the treasures of darkness, riches stored in secret places, so that you may know that I am the Lord, the God of Israel, who summons you by name. For the sake of Jacob, my servant, of Israel, of Israel, my chosen, I summon you by name and bestow on you a title of honor, though you do not acknowledge me. I am the Lord, and there is no other. Apart from me, there is no God. I will strengthen you, though you have not acknowledged me, so that from the rising of the sun to the place of its setting, men may know there is none beside me. I am the Lord, and there is no other. I form the light and create darkness. I bring prosperity and create disaster. I, the Lord, do all these things. Go look at verse 24. Uh, I call you by name. And I bestow on you a title of honor, even though you do not acknowledge me. The title of honor that God bestows on Cyrus is that Cyrus is his anointed one. In Hebrew, Messiah. Christ. So, God uses Cyrus as his anointed agent to deliver his people from exile even though Cyrus doesn't acknowledge him. Amazing. No wonder the people found it hard to take. Now, it's confrontational. Now, this was prophesied before 539. Sometime before here. And it denotes the miraculous it prophesies the miraculous uh, success of Cyrus in defeating the Babylonians and in setting his people free from captivity. Any questions on that? There's lots of stuff here that you'll have to fill in at some time in your study uh, because of its great importance. Now I'd like to uh, uh, go on uh, and have a close look at what are some of the three most important passages in the book of Isaiah? The so-called three servant songs. Now I need to give you just a little bit of background. You've all done some Hebrew, no, most of you have done Hebrew, and you know that Eveth, quite literally, is servant. Um, but it means first and foremost a worker, somebody who works for another. And uh, the way servant is used here is God's deputy. Now the following people are called the servant of the Lord. And in what sense? Number one, Abraham is called God's servant. Number two, the high priest. is called the servant of the Lord. Number three, each prophet is called the servant of the Lord. But most importantly, David and all his successors are called the servant of the Lord. Lastly, Israel and every Israelite is called the servant of the Lord. Now servant can mean deputy, but it can also be one who performs divine service and therefore one who worships. Who serves God, who works with God, who works for God and who worships God. Now here God is going to speak about his servant. Um, here are the possible exegetical options. What is God speaking about here? Now, um, 
the prophecies we have here are some of the most important in the whole of the Old Testament. Let's take them one by one. Chapter 42, 1 to 4, and get an identikit uh, here. Does God seem to be speaking here about a second Abraham? A second priest? A great priest? Is he speaking about a prophet? Is he speaking about a king? Um, we'll just leave this aside here because this doesn't seem to fit here. Whose turn to read? Levi. Here is my servant whom I uphold, my chosen one, and whom I delight. Just stop there. God is the speaker here and he is introducing his servant to us. You get the picture? Yep. You have an assembly, we are the audience, and he here is presenting, introducing his chosen servant. Okay, keep going. I will put my spirit on him, and he will bring justice to the nations. He will not shout or cry out, or raise his voice in the streets. A bruised reed he will not break, and a smouldering wick he will not snuff out. And faithfulness he will bring forth justice. He will not falter or be discouraged till he establishes justice on earth. In his land, the island... Not in his law. In his uh, law. Just change that. In his teaching, Torah, or by his teaching, in his teaching, Torah, in his teaching, the islands will put their hope. Now, you get the following uh, picture. Number one, here God uh, introduces his servant and he identifies him as his chosen servant, his deputy. Um, is it a priest? Is it a prophet? Is it a king? Just look at the language. It could be a prophet because there's Torah teaching, but it seems to fit king best of all. Why? Because he's empowered with God's spirit. Could be prophet or king, but remember God promises to put his spirit on the shoot from the stump of Jesse. His task is to extend God's justice, God's rule over the nations. Uh, how does he deal with people? He deals with the smouldering wick, weak, poor people. He doesn't blow them out. The reed, which is very fragile, he doesn't bruise, but he deals gently with people. He's not harsh. He doesn't use power to deal with the problems he faces. Uh, he's gentle with oppressed people. He's faithful to God. And what's his method of operation? How does he bring justice to the nations? Not with the sword, but with teaching. Now, he seems to be a king, but he's a king with a difference. Because he doesn't bring justice with the sword, he brings justice by teaching, and he does so gently. Yes? Doesn't Jesus make a whip? Yep. But against who? He cleans out the temple. Yeah. Yep. It's going to be it's going to be Christ and it's going to bring together the office of king, prophet, and priest, which was set. Okay, just 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 put that on hold, but don't jump ahead. Read it first of all in the uh, with the eyes of people who first heard it. This is the first servant song. And you can see what there's an identical picture that's beginning to emerge here. Um, but notice the exegetical options here. It could be priest, but it's mainly royal, but there's some prophetic stuff here. Okay, let's look at the next song. Um, Stephen, can you read chapter 49? And here you get the servant himself speaking. And he addresses all the nations of the earth. He's reporting about his mission as God's servant to the nations. Listen to me, you islands. Hear this, you distant nations. Before I was born, the Lord called me. From my birth, he has made mention of my name. He made my mouth like a sharpened sword. 
in the shadow of his hand. Notice mouth sharp and sword. Remember we had that earlier? Um, chapter uh, 9, the rod of his mouth. Keep going. He made me into a polished arrow and concealed me in his quiver. He said to me, you are my servant, Israel, in whom I will display my splendor. Just stop there. So um, the servant here reports God's commission of him, appointment of him as his agent. And he was chosen already before he was born. God chose him as his servant and uh, he said, you'll be my servant and I'm going to display my splendor, my glory, my power through you. Now how successful has the servant been? Keep going. But I said, I have labored to no purpose. I have spent my strength in vain and for nothing. Yet what is due me is in the Lord's hand. Hand. My reward is with my God. Okay. The servant reports, God commissioned me to be a servant and I failed. Despite all my efforts, I haven't succeeded. But he says, okay, it doesn't depend on me. God's the boss. It's up to him. And what's God's response to the failure, the apparent failure of his servant? He says, instead of bad, he says, good. Keep going. And now the Lord says... He who formed me in the womb to be his servant, to bring Jacob back to him and gather Israel to himself. For I am honoured in the eyes of the Lord, and my God has been my strength. Just put pause there. What was his initial task? The task of God's servant was to bring Israel back to God. Can I repeat that again? The task of God's servant is to bring the Israelites back to God. And he failed in that. So what does God say? Keep going. He says, It is too small a thing for you to be my servant, to restore the tribes of Jacob, and bring back those of Israel I have kept. I will also make you a light for the Gentiles, that you may bring my salvation to the ends of the earth. Why not? He says, good, you've failed. Okay, he said, now that's, that's, that's just a warmer up. Uh, you failed in that, so okay, I'll give you more to do. Usually it works the other way. A person in responsibility gives a little task to somebody that they authorise to work for them. And if they fail, then they're stripped of their responsibilities. If they succeed, they have bigger responsibilities. Here you get back to front. He fails and God says, good, you failed. Now, that's not enough for you. I will. Not only are you to restore Israel to me, but you're to bring... Uh, my light to the nations and salvation, my victory to the peoples of the earth. Yes? I'm just wondering, so these two are talking about the same person, are they? Yep. And because um, uh, number 42 says he will not be discouraged, but then number 49 says, uh, but I have said, oh, but I said I have labored to no purpose. I've spent my strength and gain for nothing. So it sounds like he's discouraged. Okay, you work that out for yourself. Okay. Finish this off now. Uh, the last part there, verse, uh, just also verse 7 then. God's response. Can, no, I just want to have this first. This is what the Lord says, the Redeemer and Holy One of Israel, to him who was despised and abhorred by the nation, to the servant of rulers, Kings will see you and rise up. Princes will see and bow down. Because of the Lord who is faithful, the Holy One of Israel, who has chosen you. Okay. What's your question now? Um, elsewhere, it, it talks about that he, did not, he will know that he can suffer in vain. He will know that... He yes, we'll come to that in a minute. Oh, yes. <laughs> That's the second song. Um, so, we're on the second song. He reports his mission to the nations. He reports the fact that he's commissioned by God. He reports that he failed. And because he failed, then God gave him... Um, he relied on God for vindication. And God gave him a new mission, a new commission, to save both Israelites and all the nations of the earth. Now you get the next song. David, can you go to chapter 50... Yep. Verse 4 through to verse 9. 
the Sovereign Lord has given me an instruction, an instructed tongue to know the word that sustains the weary. He awakens me morning by morning, we, awakens my ear to listen like one being taught. The Sovereign Lord has opened my ears and I have not been rebellious. I have not drawn back. Why don't just stop there? Take notice of the picture here. This per the servant says, every morning God opens my ears to hear his word so that I can speak his word of comfort to his people. What does it sound like this servant is here? A He's a prophet. This is classical prophetic stuff. The opening of the ears. And he says that he hasn't been rebellious. Uh, now, um, how successful was he in his mission to prophesy? Keep going. Uh, I offered my back to those who beat me, my cheeks to those who pulled out my beard. I did not hide my face from mocking and spitting, because the Sovereign Lord helps me, I will not be disgraced. Therefore have I set my face like flint, and I know I will not be put to shame. He who vindicates me is near. Who then will bring charges against me? Let us face each other. Who is my accuser? Let him confront me. It is the Sovereign Lord who helps me. Who is he that will condemn me? They will all wear out like a garment. The moths will eat them up. Two. Three things here that are important. Number one is that this servant of God every morning receives the word of God and he speaks the word of God as comfort to his people. Secondly, uh, he is obedient as a prophet despite terrible persecution um, and ridicule. Uh, so as instead of the people welcoming his word, they reject both the word and they reject him. And yet he remains faithful in the face of persecution and relies on God for his vindication. Dylan, please. please. Uh, now, um, you, have the, you get the theme of suffering here, which is going to be the main theme in the last and the greatest of the servant songs. Um, can we go to chapter 52, verse 13? The last, the most important servant song. Now, to get the big picture, first of all, first of all, you get um, God's, uh, here we have, you get God's uh, report about his servant, and then you get the people's report, and then you get God's appraisal of the servant's mission. Karen, can you start off reading chapter 52 to the end of uh, uh, 21 to, to 23? Chapter 52, verse 22 to 23. No, 13, no, I'm wrong. 13 to 15, sorry. See, my servant will act wisely. He will be wise and lifted up and highly exalted, just as there were many who were appalled at him. His appearance was so disfigured beyond that of my enemy, and his form mailed beyond him like mills. So he will be sprinkled many nations, and kings will shut their mouth because of him. But here God reports the fact that even though the servant was marred and disfigured and rejected. He has exalted his servant higher than all others, and he will sprinkle many nations. Now, um, what does it sound like? Sprinkling many nations with what? High priest. Okay, what does the high priest sprinkle? Blood. Blood. So, here you get this. The first two prophecies seem to point to a person who is a king, but he has some prophetic characteristics. This, the third one, prophet, but now we get somebody who is king, prophet, and priest. Now take notice of that in what follows. Tony, can we um, hear what the peoples say about this uh, servant of God? Chapter 1 through uh, to to verse 10, chapter uh, 53, verse 1, through to verse 10. It's Friday. Yeah. <laughs> Who has believed our message, and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? He grew up before him like a tender shoot, and like a root out of dry ground. 
He had no beauty or majesty to attract us to him, nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by man, man a man of sorrows and a man familiar with suffering. Like one who from men hide their faces, he was despised and we esteemed him not. Surely he took up our affirmities and carries our sorrows, yet we considered him stricken by God, smitten by him and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions, he was crushed for our iniquities, and punished. that punishment that brought, it, brought us peace was upon him, and by his wounds we are healed. We all, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before her shears is silent, so he did not open his mouth. By oppression and judgment he was taken away, and who can speak of his descendants? For he was cut off from the land of the living, for the transgressions of my people he was stricken. He was assigned a grave with the wicked, and with the rich in his death, and with the rich in his death, though he had done no violence, nor was any deceit in his mouth. Yet it was the Lord's will to crush him and cause him to suffer. And though the Lord makes his life a guilt, guilt offering, he will see his offspring and prolong his days, and the will of the Lord will prosper in his hand. So you get a picture here, not so much of a priest, but of a sacrifice, a victim. So instead of people being punished, this servant is punished. He suffers for the sins of the people. He, uh, his suffering brings healing to them. He is a guilt offering for the sins of the people. So you have a high one who is both priest and victim. He's the one who sprinkles many, but he is also the one who suffers on behalf of the people and whose life is sacrificed on behalf of the people so that the people can return to God and receive healing from God. Yes, Garth? Um, just with like Abraham, how he succeeds on behalf yes. of the Israelites, is this kind of talk about the same kind of thing, about yes. seeing on behalf of his life? Well, we'll come to that in a minute now, and you can read it. I will. Now, you get God's report, so you get God's perspective, first of all, looking back on the event, then you get the people's description of the servant, so the servant isn't the people because the people here describe the servant. And now you get God's uh, appraisal of the servant and his role. Can you read from verse um, 10 through to the end of the chapter, please, Garth? And this summarizes the, this song and draws it all together. After the suffering of his soul, he will see the light of life and be satisfied by his knowledge, my righteousness, my right, sorry, my righteous servant will justify many, and he will bear their iniquities. But he will justify many because he bears their iniquities. What will he do? Therefore, I will give him a portion among the great, and he will divide the spoils with the strong, because he poured out his life unto death, and was, num and was numerous with the transgressors. And was numbered, and so with, was numbered with the transgressors. We bore the sins of many and made intercession for the transgressors. Right, this righteous servant will uh, gain, he will receive the spoils of victory, God's victory over all evil powers, and he will divide the spoils among his followers. He will justify, he'll be the righteous one who will justify sinners. What, how will he be able to justify sinners? Because he has borne their iniquity. He's poured out his life to death for them, and he makes intercession for transgressors. Now, if you follow that through, Garth, who are the intercessors here? A king is not primarily an intercessor. Intercessor? Prophet can intercede. Abraham too. And a, a priest, but to a lesser extent. So what you have here is some future figure who is the servant of the Lord who will suffer, die, ra be raised from the dead 
and will establish God's rule over the nations. And it will be both Jews and Gentiles who will be included in his rule. Can you see why this is so important for us? Uh, because the basic Christian confession of faith is that this suffering servant is Jesus. And Jesus is not just Messiah, but he is prophet, priest and king, all rolled in one. Let's have a look at the... Oh no, first, before I go beyond that, any questions on that? Anyway? Now, the question of kingship. Remember that God had prophesied that he would establish a banquet on Mount Zion. Let's have a look at the, uh, uh, a passage which talks about the messianic banquet. The banquet that would be uh, on Mount Zion. Uh, Joshua, can you start reading chapter 55, verses 1 and 2? Ho, oh, everyone who thirsts, come to the waters. And you that have no money, come, buy and eat. Come, buy wine and milk without money and without price. Why do you spend your money for that which is not bread, and your labour for that which does not satisfy? Listen carefully to me, and eat what is good, and delight yourselves in rich food. Just read the first part of verse 3, then 2. Incline your ear and come to me. Listen so that you may live. I don't know, what kind of a banquet is this? You have somebody inviting people to a banquet, a free meal, but it's a strange banquet because it's not a banquet of eating, but it's a banquet of hearing. So feasting not with the tongue, but feasting with the ear. And uh, by hearing the food that will be given, you will receive life. So it's a life-giving, life-sustaining meal and the nourishment comes through hearing the word. Please go on, Josh. I will make with you an everlasting covenant, my steadfast, sure love for David. Well, I don't know. Just stop there. Uh, God is going to extend the covenant that he made with David to all the people who are invited to this banquet. So in this banquet... Uh, what God promised to David and to the Messiah will be given to all people. The next part. See, I made him a witness to the peoples, a leader and commander for the people. See, you shall call nations that you do not know, and nations that do not know you shall run to you. Because of the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, for he has glorified you. Stop, the Lord. Stop, just stop there. You get a comparison here. Uh, God says, see, I made him, that's David, a witness to the nations, a leader and commander of the people, not the peoples. If you've got plural there, people. Um, David was a witness to God in the songs of praise that he sang. The songs of praise he sang were a witness to the nations, and in those songs of praise he commanded the nations to come and join him in praising God. But at the same time, he commanded them to come and repent, come back to God, and to praise God. And so, just as David bore witness to God by praising God, telling the nations to join him in praising God, and calling on the nations to repent, so all this, the people involved in this meal <coughs> will praise God, and bear witness to God, and call on the nations to repent. Now read the last part, and this is the message that they will proclaim in this meal to the nations. Keep going. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake their way, and the unrighteous their thoughts. Let them return to the Lord, that he may have mercy on them. And to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. What's the message? that will be proclaimed through this meal. For whom is this meal? Is it for only righteous people all over the world? It's for sinners. Seek the Lord where or while he be bound. Call on him where he is near. Why? 
Let the wicked forsake their way, the evil man his thoughts. Let them turn, repent to the Lord, for he will have mercy on him to our God, for he will freely pardon. So you get a meal hosted here. The Messiah hosts a meal. In this meal, he extends the covenant of David to include people from all over the world. It's a free meal. It's a meal of hearing God's word. It's a meal of feasting on the word of God. And in this meal, uh, it's, a, it's a meal in which sinners are invited to come and repent and receive mercy and pardon, grace and forgiveness from the Lord. Remember what Jesus said when he instituted Holy Communion, take and drink. This is the blood of the new covenant which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. The Lord's Supper is a banquet of forgiveness. It's a banquet in which we, which uh, calls sinners to repent and offers them the forgiveness of God. It's both Jews and Gentiles and this meal is free. It's a meal in which we hear the word of God and receive life from God. Wonderful, uh, wonderful promise. Next period, I want to do something a little bit ambitious, which is next uh, Wednesday, isn't it? Holy Week. We won't have any next Friday because it's Good Friday. I want to finish work on Isaiah very quickly and then see if I can cover uh, Jeremiah as well. Wow. 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 We'll see. That's a, maybe overly ambitious, but we'll see how we go. So be ready for a race. Okay.